How to fit reversing gear to a Stuart 5A steam engine. Part 3. Making link pins and machining a new drop arm shaft. The valve gear was loosely assembled in the last episode, but now I need the expansion link, because I need to use it as a test gauge when I make the pins. My friend in the USA, who is the owner of this engine, wants to paint it, and I'm really pleased about that, it will save me some time. And I can get on with the mechanical jobs. In this clip, I'm just checking the size of the hexagon that I need to machine the pins out of. This is some stainless steel hexagon, and I generally use this for pins because they don't go rusty, and it seems to wear quite well. So into the chuck we go, and I'm rough turning it to shape. I need to reduce the outside diameter to 9 64 of an inch for 3 quarters of an inch along the length of the piece. And in this clip, as you can see, I'm frequently checking the part with a ruler. The length of 3 quarters of an inch is not that critical, this is slightly over. Because once I've fitted the parts to the expansion link and the fork, I'll be trimming them to the exact length. But that will be after the pins are finished. There are different ways of holding these pins in position in the valve fork. I could cross drill them and just fit a washer and split pin. But I'm going to thread each end of the pins 4BA. The part of these pins that fits into the expansion link and the forks in the eccentric rods needs to be machined accurately to 9 64 of an inch. But the end part needs to be a bit less than that, so I can thread it using a 4BA die in my die holder. As I approach the finished dimension, I'm taking very fine cuts. A final check with the micrometer verifies that this pin is 9 64 of an inch in diameter, and it's a good bearing fit in the expansion link. When you make simple components like this, you need to make sure you do not leave them too tight. If this is a tight fit in the expansion link, then no oil can get in there, so you have metal to metal contact and it will wear out very quickly. Don't forget to leave enough room for the lubricating oil. In this clip, I'm just checking that I have half an inch of unthreaded shaft, which will go through the valve fork and the expansion link. And now it's time to part off the component. I'm using some lubricant on this, but you can't really see it because it's WD-40. This is fairly close to mass production. I have to make two of these pins. This is the second one. I'm making it in exactly the same way as I made the first one, but I really am using different footage. I suppose I could have used the video footage from the first one, but no, I like to show it as I do it. I think it's time for another squirt of WD-40. It's not the best cutting lubricant that I've ever used, but it's very convenient in the spray can, and this is definitely my lubricant of the week. The idea of this job is to make the pins accurately, and make sure that both of them look identical to each other. And now, as before, it's time to part off the finished component. And as before, I'm leaving the head of the pin larger than it needs to be, because the next step is to machine the hexagon part of the pin. I've left the hexagon bar stock sticking out of the chuck, and I'm using a cutting tool to shape the end. Do I want it to look like this? Well, no, I don't want it to come to a point. I'm going to change the angle of the tool and see if that looks any better. No, it's still too pointy. I bought a couple of these lathe tools from Blackgate's Engineering a few weeks back. I thought they would come in useful as general purpose form tools. This is a carbide tip tool and all I had to do was just grind a concave part into the side of the tip. And just in case you don't know, when you're grinding carbide tip tools, you can't use ordinary grinding wheels. You need to use a green grit wheel. Once the parts are polished up, the two on the left are the ones I've just made, the one on the right is the original. And I know it looks slightly different, but I couldn't machine it any more than that because it was too thin. Here's one of the pins that I made, and as I said earlier, it is too long. There isn't much clearance between the assembly that moves the expansion link and the expansion link pins. So what I had to do is grind off a little bit of the end, and also due to lack of clearance, I'm using a very shallow nut. With the pins in place, I'm just moving the expansion link from side to side, just to make sure that it moves correctly. The next part of the job is to replace this pin that supports the drop arm. It's got two holes drilled in the middle of it, and it's made from the wrong material. Look, it's a bit of a mess. Something's gone wrong here. I do know what's gone wrong, I'll explain later. 
Normally, I would make a simple shaft and lock tight a collar onto it, but I thought, just for a change, I'll machine it out of a big piece of steel. The first thing to do is to reduce the outside diameter of the piece of steel to the same diameter as the boss on the reversing lever. I have the works took out quite a long way from the chuck and I'm taking a deep cut and I'm doing this on purpose and it's also a dry cut. You can hear it squeaking. This is called chatter. A bit of WD-40 helps and the smoke's quite a good effect as well. Proper water-based coolant is better because WD-40 doesn't really cool the part down and I don't think it's a good idea to breathe the smoke in. I find for these machining jobs, one of the best lubricants I have is my general purpose oiling mixture, which is 50% steam oil, 25% three-in-one machine oil, and 25% rapeseed oil, which is also known as canola oil. But as I said earlier, the WD-40 is lubricant of the week because I've just bought a tin of it and I really like the nozzle on the end of it. The nozzle has a pipe on the end, and normally the pipes were just attached to the can and you lost them immediately. But the design of these new WD-40 nozzles is really good. I turned the outside diameter of this part to the same as the boss on the handle, and I turned a lesser diameter, which is 5 16 of an inch, to fit in the mounting bracket. What am I doing here? Well, I've reversed it in the chuck, and I'm machining the other end to 5 16 of an inch and this is the end that the handle will be mounted on. I need to make it so that this part that goes through the handle is slightly longer. It's always a good idea on steam engines to just leave a little bit sticking out. The full size seemed to be like that. I also drilled a hole in the end of it using a centre drill once I'd machined it to length. And that's because the shaft of this diameter on a full size steam engine would most likely have been turned between centres. So why were the two holes in the original brass shaft? Well, the problem is, it's logical to set this arm at 90 degrees, but that's not always right. It needs to be set to the position of the valve gear. The movement of the arm is limited by the quadrant, so a few test runs are in order just to make sure that when you move the arm in the quadrant, the two pins that I've made need to line up perfectly with the pin that's in the valve fork. And if you get this wrong, the valve gear will not work properly. I'll describe and show this in more detail in the next episode. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.